on World News Tonight. Trudeau on top. The Canadian people have spoken as the then Prime Minister is now here to stay. Expanding arsenal. Pfizer claims the latest weapon against fighting the pandemic is child-friendly. Migrant mania. Texas deals the latest surge of immigrants from across the river. Historic splashdown. SpaceX ushers in the latest era of Earth's space age. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Other Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Anuradhi Wickramasinghe. Good evening and thank you for joining with us on World News Tonight. We start off today's coverage with Canada's concluded election run. After a 35-day race, the voters have spoken and they've decisively chosen to stick to the status quo. After Canada's most expensive federal election in history, the electoral map is largely unchanged. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau won a third term on Monday, but his party fell short of a majority. Trudeau in power since 2015 and governing with a minority of seats since 2019 had hoped to capitalise on his government's handling of the pandemic by calling in an early vote. Instead, he was met by an unexpectedly tight race. His lacklustre campaign was acerbated by voter anger at the decision to call an election during a health crisis, a point Trudeau acknowledged in his speech to supporters in Montreal. I hear you when you say that you just want to get back to the things you love, not worry about this pandemic or about an election, that you just want to know that your members of parliament of all stripes will have your back through this crisis and beyond. CBC and CTV projected that Trudeau's Liberal government would hold a minority of seats in the House of Commons. Elections Canada showed the Liberals leading in 156 electoral districts nationally, one more than they held before the vote, leading one commentator to dub it a Groundhog Day election. The Conservatives, led by Erin O'Toole, were in second place and conceded defeat as results trickled in late into the night. A second minority government will mean Trudeau's Liberals will have to rely again on opposition parties, such as the left-leaning New Democratic Party, to pass legislation. Trudeau has pledged to work with other parties to get the country through the pandemic. He said the results meant he had a clear mandate and that brighter days were ahead. Moving on with yet another election update, Russia's opposition accused the authorities of mass voter fraud after election results showed the ruling United Russia Party winning a sweeping majority in Parliament. The three-day vote followed an unprecedented crackdown of critics of President Vladimir Putin and came with pre-election polls showing United Russia's popularity at a historic low. A transparent and free parliamentary poll according to Russia's Electoral Commission after three days of voting that has left the ruling United Russia Party firmly in the lead. That, though, stands in contrast to numerous accusations of fraud. Even as United Russia celebrated on Sunday night, reports were filtering in of ballot stuffing and falsifications on a massive scale, a claim from organizations linked to jailed Kremlin critic Alexei Navalny. His allies saw a heavy crackdown in the run-up to the vote, with some arrested and others fleeing the country. Navalny had called for a tactical voting campaign, where people vote for the most likely candidate to win against a united Russia incumbent, a likely cause for a significant rise in numbers for the Communist Party, which made gains overall, despite a good amount of voter apathy in the face of united Russia's grip on power. Others, though, were still behind the ruling party. Elsewhere, the pro-Kremlin Liberal Democrats and Just Russia parties, along with newcomers, new people, were all set to enter Parliament, coming in over the 5% threshold. Over in Germany now, the Conservative candidate aiming to succeed German Chancellor Angela Merkel faced pressure during a televised election debate that was one of his last chances to catch up with Social Democrat rival Olaf Scholz. Let's cross over to Other There in a World News special correspondent Inuka Aponzo reporting from Cleve in Germany. Inuka? Yes, Anuradi. Social Democratic Party Chancellor candidate Olaf Scholz and his Green Party rival Annalena Bauerbock often showed a united front against the Christian Democratic Union's Armin Laschet in the third and last TV debate ahead of next Sunday's election. The candidates are the front-runners in the race to replace outgoing Chancellor Angela Merkel. At the end of another 90 minutes of spicy argument, 
in what has turned into an ever tighter election race, both Baerbock and then Scholz suggested that it would be good if the CDU were to enter the opposition, though they were keen underlined that they would be willing to negotiate with all parties except the far-right alternative for Germany. Laschet, meanwhile, appeared notably less aggressive than during the last debate. The overall numbers continue to favour Scholz. A FOSA poll released shortly after the debate showed that 42% of viewers thought that the Social Democrat had won the debate, followed by 27% for Laschet and 25% for Barbock. That was broadly in line with the latest national opinion poll published by INSA, which had the same rankings, albeit with a much narrower lead for the SPD with 26% compared to the CDU's 21%, and the Greens, 15%. Back to you, Anuradi. All right, thank you. That was Adha Dharana World News Special Correspondent Inuka Aponzo reporting from Cleve in Germany. The U.S. Homeland Security Secretary said that the authorities would investigate reports that Haitian migrants in Texas may have been abused by Border Patrol officers on horseback. It's a direction far less traveled. But for many of these Haitian migrants, crossing back over the Rio Grande into Mexico is the best method to avoid an unsavory deportation from the United States. Following the earthquake in Haiti last month, Washington for a brief while chose to temporarily suspend deportations to the Caribbean nation. But in recent days, the Biden administration has begun sending flights full of people back to Port-au-Prince. Only Haitians living in the United States before July 29th are eligible for temporary protected status. We have reiterated that our borders are not open and people should not make the dangerous journey. Individuals and families are subject to border restrictions, including expulsion. Thousands of Haitians have meanwhile found themselves stranded under a bridge in Del Rio, Texas, blocked from moving on. U.S. authorities are also investigating allegations of abuse at the camp by Border Patrol officers on horseback. Recent video footage appears to show riders swinging their long reins to threaten migrants and push them back towards the river. With tensions rising internationally amidst the latest defence pact, the French Foreign Minister in New York for UN meetings called for Europeans to think hard about alliances after Paris was outraged by the loss of mega submarine contract with Australia. An unexpected guest at the UN General Assembly, the diplomatic row between France and the US prompted by Australia's sudden cancellation of a 30 billion euro submarine contract last week in favour of a new deal with Washington and London, known as AUKUS. For Paris, it's a serious breakdown of trust between allies. French Foreign Minister Jean-Yves Le Drian added that the geopolitical approach is cause for concern. What seems significant here in this pact that's being established between Australia, the US and the UK in the South Pacific is that its priority is a confrontational attitude towards China. He reiterated that France and Europe were still committed to multilateral solutions to global preoccupations. The issue was top of the agenda at Monday's meeting of European foreign ministers, with UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson seeking to downplay tensions as he stressed the importance of the cross-channel alliance. The AUKUS pact will see Australia acquire at least eight nuclear-powered submarines from the US and UK in a deal aimed at countering China's growing military power in the Asia-Pacific. European Commissioner President Ursula von der Leyen has called the treatment of France unacceptable, while EU Council Chief Charles Michel has denounced a lack of loyalty from the US. The fallout could have implications for ongoing free trade talks between the EU and Australia. The rupture has become a flashpoint for Europeans, including French President Emmanuel Macron, who has long argued that Europe needs to take greater control of its own defence priorities an issue that's risen in prominence since America's military withdrawal from Afghanistan. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. Now for the latest updates on the COVID pandemic. 
The White House announced that the United States in November will reopen air travelers from many European countries along with China and India who are fully vaccinated against COVID-19, rolling back tough pandemic-related travel restrictions imposed beginning early last year. After a year and a half of blocking most non-U.S. citizens from traveling to America in a never-before-seen effort to battle the health crisis, the U.S. is finally lifting international travel restrictions, but only for those who are vaccinated. Beginning in early November, most passengers arriving from China, India, Britain, and many other European countries who have received the shot will be allowed to enter, White House Coronavirus Response Coordinator Jeff Zentz announced on Monday. There will be some exceptions to the vaccine policy, officials said. Children not yet eligible to be vaccinated will be let in. And the new rules do not yet apply to travelers crossing land borders with Mexico and Canada. The United States currently bars most non-U.S. citizens who have been in Britain, parts of Europe without border controls, Ireland, China, India, South Africa, Iran and Brazil within the last 14 days. The U.S. has been under intense pressure to ease restrictions, particularly on U.K. travelers. Travel across the Atlantic is one of the world's busiest and most lucrative international routes. Monday's decision comes ahead of a visit this week to the White House by U.K. Prime Minister Boris Johnson, where the topic was expected to come up. Britain started allowing fully vaccinated U.S. travelers to enter the country in August. Airlines have been lobbying for an end to the ban for months, which was put in place in the early days of the global health crisis back in 2020, hoping the ban would be lifted for the peak summer vacation season. Now they're looking forward to the lucrative end-of-the-year holiday travel season. Shares of major U.S. airlines with international routes, Delta, American, and United were mostly higher in midday Monday trading. JetBlue, which just started service to the U.K. in August, moved slightly to the upside. International Consolidated Airlines Group, parent of British Airways and a host of other European air carriers, surged about 10%. Researchers are collecting samples from bats in northern Cambodia in a bid to understand the coronavirus pandemic, returning to a region where a very similar virus was found in the animals a decade ago. Samples from bats in northern Cambodia may tell us more about COVID-19. Researchers in Phnom Penh discovered a virus similar to the coronavirus in horseshoe bat samples collected a decade ago. Tests done on them last year revealed a close relative to the coronavirus. Tarvi Holm was part of an eight-member team that logged the region's bat species, sex, age, and other data last month. The reason that we select this location as our study site because based on previous study, they found that there is a special richness of bat uh, diversity in this area, especially for the horseshoe bat. We hope that from the result from this study can help the world to have a better understand about the COVID-19. Host species like bats don't typically display symptoms of the virus they carry, but it can be devastating if transmitted to humans or other animals. Deadly viruses originating from bats include Ebola and other coronaviruses such as SARS and Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. But leading virologist Dr. Weiss Nandong said humans were responsible for COVID-19, which has killed nearly 5 million people worldwide due to interference and destruction of habitats. He said, quote, if we try to be near wildlife, the chances of getting the virus carried by wildlife are more than normal. The chances of the virus transforming to infect humans are also more. The project at the Institut Pasteur de Cambodge aims to look at how the wildlife trade could be playing a part transmitting deadly viruses. Australia has locked down Sydney and Melbourne, its largest cities, and the capital Canberra to quell an outbreak of the highly infectious Delta variant. But these tough restrictions have triggered anti-lockdown rallies with police arresting hundreds in both cities over the weekend. Let's cross over to other there in a world news special correspondent Timothy Philip reporting from Melbourne in Australia for more. Timothy? Yes, Anuradhi. Hundreds demonstrated in lockdown Melbourne after authorities shut down construction sites in the city for two weeks, saying the frequent movement of workers was spreading the coronavirus into regional areas. Footage showed protesters marching through the city streets, setting up flares and chanting, with mounted police and officers in riot gear following them. 
The decision to halt building activities comes after an anti-vaccine mandate protest in the city turned violent. The Victorian government requires all construction workers to have at least one vaccine dose by the end of this week. The forced closures of construction sites will worsen the country's economic activity, with some economists predicting the extended lockdowns may push Australia's almost $2 trillion economy into a second recession in as many years. A total of 603 new cases were detected in Victoria, the year's biggest daily rise, eclipsing the previous high of 567 a day earlier, and one new death was recorded. Back to you, Anuradi. All right, thank you. That was Other Than a World News Special Correspondent Timothy Phillip reporting from Melbourne in Australia. We have some good news for you. Pfizer and BioNTech said that their COVID-19 vaccine induced a robust immune response in 5 to 11-year-olds, adding that the US-German partnership plans to ask for regulatory authorization as soon as possible to vaccinate children in that age range in the United States, Europe and elsewhere. It could be another weapon in the fight against the global pandemic. Pfizer's announcement that its jab works on children between the ages of 5 and 11 may bring countries a step closer to vaccinating youngsters. The US drug giant says it gave children only a third of what's used in current shots, but that the antibody response was just as effective. Most countries have only vaccinated people aged 12 and over. Pfizer now says it aims to apply for regulator approval by the end of the month. And if they approve the shot, the company says it could help children get back to having a normal upbringing. Not everyone is on board for now. Pfizer made the announcement in a press release and has yet to publish the details in a scientific journal. Other scientists called the report encouraging, but insisted they want to see more data before giving it the go-ahead. Volcanic eruptions caused alarm on the Spanish Canary Island of La Palma as authorities expressed that all individuals must exercise extreme caution around the area. Here at the edge of La Palma Island, Pedro Sanchez surveys the eruption site. The sea lies before him, but tongues of lava are flowing fast towards the coastline. Travelling at an average speed of 700 metres per hour and at close to a piping hot 1,000 degrees Celsius, concern is growing about the damage the Molten River could leave behind. Right now, the most important thing is to ensure safety. We must ensure a safety perimeter. We're still in a stage of eruption with volcanic activity, so let's not come near it. Let's stay as far as possible. In the early hours of Monday morning, many houses were still up in flames, with hectares of surrounding land evidently scorched. But despite the harrowing scenes, no loss of life has been reported thus far. Like these shepherds who refused to leave their goats behind, more than 5,000 others have been evacuated from their homes since Sunday, although it's unclear when they'll be able to return. Until its eruption, the volcano at Cumbra Vieja had slumbered peacefully for 50 years. But the latest activity could last for some time to come, as another magma reserve has been located at a depth of nearly 30 kilometers underground. Welcome back. And for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Algeria buried the North African country's longest serving president at a cemetery for its independence heroes, but without the honors accorded to his predecessors. Boxing star Manny Pacquiao said he will run for Philippines presidency in the 2022 election, declaring his political plan after railing at corruption in government and President Rodrigo Duterte's cozy relationship with China. A student gunman opened fire at a university in Russian city of Perm, killing eight people. The gunman was detained shortly after the incident at Perm State University, located around 1,300 kilometers east of Moscow. And finally tonight, SpaceX has ushered in a new era into Earth's space age. The all-civilian crew returned to Earth, completing a historic three-day flight in orbit. Tonight, a new era ushered in by four brave Americans. Inspiration 4, welcome home to planet Earth. Thanks so much, SpaceX. It was a heck of a ride for us. Their history-making ride culminating in a white-knuckled final hour. The tiny SpaceX Dragon capsule returning to Earth, traveling 17,500 miles per hour. 
Parachutes slowing their speed to 15 miles an hour, splash down, and then that celebration. And there she is. Former St. Jude's cancer patient Haley Arsenal first out the hatch, followed by a dancing Cyan Proctor, Chris Sembrowski, <laughs> and fist-pumping billionaire funder Jared Isaacman. Their three-day mission lifting the ceiling on space travel and moving boundaries for charities. SpaceX boss Elon Musk helping St. Jude's cross their $200 million fundraising goal, tweeting, count me in for $50 million. And here comes Dragon out of the water. Watching from home, nine-year-old former cancer patient Alana. I have always dreamed about wanting to be an astronaut. It did really inspire me because it showed me that you don't have to be an astronaut to go into space. For now, SpaceX dubbing this the second space age. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Suzanne Shanali will join you again tomorrow with another edition of World News. I'm Anuradha Vikramasinghe. Until then, stay safe and have a great night.